Hello, all. Welcome to another episode of The Manly Catholic. This is James, your host. And with me, I have a very special guest from uh, Tradition, Family, and Property, or TFP. I'm sorry, the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property. I should give the full title. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm the Vice President of John Horvat. John, welcome to The Manly Catholic Podcast. Great to be on the show. We're always great. Yeah. yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Now, John, for those of you who don't know, or maybe you're not even familiar with TFP, but John is a scholar, researcher, educator, international speaker, and author of the book, Return to Order, as well as the author of hundreds of published articles. He lives in Spring Grove, Pennsylvania. And like I said, he is the vice president of the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property, which we'll be diving into a little bit deeper today. Now, John, before I get going with the questions, I just want to start off uh, with the St. Michael prayer. All right. So start. Good. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, John, uh, just so our listeners can get to know you a little bit better, always kick kick this off with uh, two questions. So the first one is, if you could be the patron saint of anything, what would it be and why? Yeah, I thought about that question. I think it's a very good question because it uh, it really gets it, it, it gets you thinking. Um, and what I thought about was that our our um, society and our culture in general is very is a very dishonorable society. And so I was, if I were to be a patron saint of something, I would put it as a patron saint of honor, which mm. is uh, to define honor. Honor is when you, uh, is the uh, esteem that people give to that which is excellence. Or if you if a person has honor, he, uh, dis- he displays that honor, the brilliance of that honor. So it's, it's the splendor of that, of that, of those, of that excellence, which that person has. And I think that's what the, you know, one of the things we're missing today a lot is this desire for excellence, the desire for beauty, the desire for truth, but to shine, to show, you know, to, to uh, manifest uh, what we have. I mean, the, the church has a lot to offer, especially in that regard. And the church always um, in its ceremonial and its way of doing things likes to display those kind of, uh, its brilliance, its, its, um, its excellence and, and, and beauty. And so that would that would probably be the the thing that I have in mind. That's I think that gives you an idea. It's I think it's something so needed today, and and I would put that to make make that my answer. I love that. I mean, there you you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, the idea of honor and even you know, chivalry. I mean, I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later yes. too. Is just totally lost in our society today. But I like that. That's why I love that question. It's always good to see what what people pull out from it. So I love <laughs> yes. that honor, patron saint of honor. So, all right. So the next one, if you could sit down with, with someone dead or alive, uh, but not Jesus, which we know would be the obvious answer, uh, who would it be and why? Now that was a hard question. I was thinking about that a long time. I even (laughs) lost some sleep over it because I was just thinking, you know, well, who would that be? And there are a lot of historic personages and people that I would like to be meet and talk with, um, now, I'd love to talk to Charlemagne. I'd like to talk to St. Louis or St. Ferdinand, but um, that wasn't the question. The question is sit, sitting down with a beer. And I wouldn't really feel comfortable sitting him down in a beer with Charlemagne or <laughs> St. Uh, St. Louis, uh, anyone of the saint, you know, I would, I would have a, a great veneration for, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't have that intimacy that it requires. Sure. So that was one thing that just said, well, that limits me. And then also the fact that we're sitting down with a beer. I mean, a beer is a very robust drink and that robustness would, you know, you, that's the topic you have to speak about. If you were speaking with us some scotch, it would be a little bit more pensive, a bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more speculative, not, you might say, or a liqueur would be something even more light, lighthearted. It would be more, it would be a, a conversation that would be, um, you know, much lighter. And then, of course, coffee and tea would be a whole different uh, ball game. <laughs> so that sort of brings me down a little bit more. 
And then the, the, thir the third limitation was the fact that, well, if you're going to have beer with someone, you might as well have a good beer. So <laughs> it would not be in a good place. It wouldn't be in Italy or Spain or uh, France, although they have good beers. But the real people who do beer is are the sort of the Anglosphere of uh, you know, Germany or, or um, yeah, England. Uh, well, of course, the United States now of is course, a very good beer place. Sure. So oh, that's that's those were my limitations. Um, you know, you could you could do a cop out and just say Churchill because he breaks all the rules and <laughs> Churchill it doesn't make any difference. But he was a Scotch person, I think, rather than a, a beer person. So the um, my choice then, I say, I was looking for somebody saying that that was a a robust person. So I was I was thinking military, and. Um, a counter-revolutionary figure, let's say, from the past, uh, um, say, let's say, um, the th person that came to my mind was Andreas Hoffer. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I'm not, no. He was a um, Austrian, so there you have the beer. Sure. Um, and he was a, he fought against Napoleon in the beginning of the 19th century and was extremely successful against the French and Napoleonic armies. He was, he was, it was a grill operation, but he just, just really destroyed uh, their troops there and uh, defeated their, a lot of their, um, their, the, defeated their troops. So that was one thing that, that was one, my, one person I had in mind. And it's probably someone more recent. I was thinking of Colonel John Ripley, um, mm. US Marine, Catholic, a uh, very good role model. Uh, he took down the Dung Ha Bridge in 1973 mm. and uh, stopped a whole army. So that would be a good person to have a beer with. And I, I would do it, you asked why, uh, to honor the person and to um, be encouraged by his action because it says, you know, things can be done, very uh, improbable things. You know, the whole establishment of Napoleon was against him. He defeated Napoleon. The whole, uh, whole division of North Vietnamese troops with tanks was coming at Colonel Ripley. He took down the bridge. He stopped the bridge. So I think it, it would be I would be very encouraged by talking with these individuals. John, I think just by the two answers you gave, we can get we can get a sense of the type of man you are. You are a deep thinker. You think about these questions. You sit on them. I mean, you you broke it down. OK, we were having a beer. So it needs to be a robust person. We're not having a scotch. I love that. <laughs> and but even the examples you gave, though, I mean, how many how how much better our society be if we had more men like that yes, who yes. who saw a need and, and they, they said something needs to be done and I'm going to be the one to do it. Right. So, exactly. So, that, so yeah, I think that's that's where we're at and we're in our situation in the world today and in the, in the nation today. I mean, it requires those type of people. Very absolutely. Robust people. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. We just need to drink more beer, I guess, and then we'll get more robust people, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if one comes before the other or what, you know, but I don't, think it's, I don't think it could hurt, you know. That's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so, John, uh, if you don't mind, uh, you can tell, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit more about your background, um, kind of lead about how you got involved with TFP, you know, more specifically about the organization for our listeners who maybe have no idea, like what the heck is TFP that you guys keep talking about and just kind of go from there and we'll, we'll see where, where that goes from there. Okay. Uh, my personal background, I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, originally from Kansas City, near Kansas City, a, a farm out in uh, just, just west of Kansas City. Um, I went to the University of Kansas during the 70s, uh, in the middle, mid 70s. Um, I met the TFP there. Uh, we had an office in Kansas City. And I, I joined the TFP uh, directly from the college. Hmm. So I've been, I've been with the organization for 45 years. Um, I've, I'm a full-time volunteer. I'm not married. And I've dedicated my life to, this, this, to, the, to the organization. So that's, that's where I came from. I, it's, it was pretty much straight out of college, just two years of college, actually. I, I left college. I went to, the, uh, to join the TFP. So that is, uh, that is my background. Uh, how, the TFP is an organization that was founded in 1960 in Brazil by Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira, who was a Catholic thinker and activist and uh, a very impressive man. I've met him, I met him many times. He died in 1995. And it's an organization that uh, later spread throughout the world and, and now is, uh, has long been in the United States. Uh, we started in 1970, more or less. That was when the American TFP started. 
And the, and the, uh, the goals and the uh, ideas of the TFP is it's centered around a book called Revolution and Counter-Revolution by Professor de Oliveira. And what this book says is that if you look at history, especially Catholic history and Western, Western civilization, you see that there are revolutions that have taken place, the Protestant Revolution, the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and we might say the sexual revolution of the 60s, and how they all have a common thread. They, all, they are all developments of a single revolution. And that they have there are there are um, that this revolution has certain tactics, certain ways of acting, ways of being, uh, ways of being uh, weaknesses, and that uh, what needs to be done is a counter revolution, and the counter revolution uh, looks at those processes and says, well, how can we defeat those those processes? How what what tactics can we use? How can we get involved in this fight? So that that is the foundation of what TFP is. This, this this fight between revolution and counter-revolution. So I know you guys do a ton of work on campuses. So have you, how I guess a broader question is how receptive when the TFP comes on either campus, if there's a, a protest or whatever is going on, are people generally receptive to the organization? I mean, because traditional Catholic teaching, obviously that's the foundation of TFP. And mm -hmm. that is, even that in itself is counter revolution and just look at society nowadays with our woke culture and things like that. Yes. So I, I have to imagine, I mean, I've seen videos online on YouTube, but I have to imagine there's a lot of pushback, but is that just the extreme show up on YouTube or in general, are most people receptive to what you guys are teaching? Like, Oh, we actually need this in society. Well, on an average campus, um, you'll get, you will, we, we will get sympathies. We'll get people come to, up to us, shake our hands, congratulate us, etc. cetera. Um, but of course, that's not the majority. That's, uh, people are afraid. People don't manifest themselves. A lot are indifferent. But you will always shake out the, the radicals and the liberals that are out there. And, and they, will, uh, they will often get very vocal, as you, as you, as you have probably seen. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we, we expect that, we prepare for that, we uh, always try to, uh, we, we, we develop our, uh, you know, be, being very calm, we are never violent, we're, we always um, are, have a certain dignity and honor that we try, we maintain, we don't, we let, uh, you know, we can't, we let them be who they are, and we are who we are. Um, you know, the impact of these campaigns is probably much, much greater than is shown in the, in the actual YouTubes. Uh, you know, later on, we'll hear people say, I saw you on campus. You know, we'll have people say, you've changed my life. Others will say, you know, um, this is really great. Uh, I'm always, whenever I see one of those YouTube videos, I'm always very edified by the comments on the, the, below because there are, you know, we'll, we'll have, uh, I mean, as much as 1.2 million views on some of these mm. videos, a lot wow. of views on those videos, and you'll get thousands of commentaries on them. And uh, it's amazing to see, you know, they, how um, people see these commentaries, you know, the commentaries, you'll have people say, um, I'm a Muslim, but I really, I really admire what you do. I'm a Protestant. I see this. I'm another one. One says, I'm an, I'm, I'm a, I'm an atheist, but TFP makes me want to believe in God. Hmm. You know, that was one of the comments. So wow. we are very, we're very um, gratified to see those, those, those repercussions. But we do, we, uh, we've always, you know, you never know the impact of what you have, what you have, what you what you do on those on those campaigns. The fact that you stood up and um, broke the consensus on campus, it really, I think, uh, we don't realize uh, how important that is, and a lot of students are very happy that to, to see us there. And we've even had uh, students say they've been praying to God that we come there and actually mm. came there. So it's really interesting yeah. to see all the, how, how these, these campaigns um, uh, are really, how, how they work. And also one thing that's also very interesting is that the young men that are on these campaigns um, really enjoy these campaigns. They really, uh, it really makes them believe their faith, live their faith much more. And in fact, they're a bit, a bit disappointed if they don't get into a, if there's not a, a, a counter protest or people are against them because they say, well, this is a boring campaign. But usually, you know, they, they do 
we do get those counter protests. You know, it's it's especially now as we get more polarized, it's almost guaranteed these days. And, you know, I, I, I think it's only going to get worse as time goes on. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what you spoke on though is so important is that especially in our society, when people who are, you can say against tradition, against what the Catholic church teaches, naturally they're more aggressive, they're more mm. emotional, they get in your face and then the, it's not necessarily the people that you're talking to, but it's the outsiders. Exactly. You know, it's the same thing. I heard people who, who do debates all the time. You're not actually trying to convince the other person you're debating. You're trying to convince the audience. That's who your audience is, basically your target, right? right. So when they see these people who are in your face, you're yelling and screaming. And then the volunteers who represent TFP, they're calm, they're chivalrous. They're trying to have uh, a logical uh, mature adult conversation. And then for someone who's on the outside, maybe they've never heard of this topic for, for whatever reason, or they don't know much about it. Like, well, why was that person so calm? And that person was screaming and yelling in their face. And right. so then you might get someone to come up, like you said, and say, Hey, what, what, what what's TFP? And it starts that conversation, which I, I love that, which is so key nowadays. Yeah. It's just having a level head and, and not, not getting emotional which is unheard no, no, of nowadays. It, definitely, it, it is there. I mean, it, they're not huge numbers, but that's, that's uh, you, you know, we, we're, not, we're not after numbers, we're after quality. Another element of those campaigns, I think that also helps is we try to, um, the, the beauty, to get the beauty, mm. the, the, the standard, the flag, the bagpipes, uh, you, know, the, you know, to uh, attract people to things that are beautiful, that are, that ha that are, that uh, are naturally attractive and, and to make the association say, well, this is beautiful. And what they're saying, you know, there is, a, there is that association. So that's another element of those campaigns. Absolutely. Yeah. And I want to backtrack just a little bit, just in the title. So the, the foundations then are tradition, family, family and property. And property. Mm -hmm. So do you mind just touching on on those, I mean, it sounds like those are kind of the pillars of the foundation and, and maybe speak to them broader, how that affects society as well. Right. Um, we consider the three pillars of Christian civilization. Tradition are those things that are handed down over generations um, and they, are, they um, take from the past and give it a future. It gives that continuity of uh, thought, of, of um, history that allows us to progress, you know, without tradition, you don't have progress, you're able to go ahead in society, you're able to take the best, refine the best that comes of, you know, of your particular historic epic and, and project it into the future. The family is the basic, is the, is the cell of society, it's the basic unit, it's the only way we can really uh, go ahead we have to we, we need to think in terms of the family and not the individual you know today is the individualism is such that people don't think in terms of family but family is that natural um, place where people uh, are allowed to develop they can they can um, project their individuality but at the same time it, it's protected by the family the family is a protection and yet also an innovator and it's a, a natural uh, school that teaches people not only um, knowledge or skills, but also temperance. You know, they are, um, the temperance is the, uh, is the virtue by which we, the intellect controls the passions. And so, uh, and so uh, the family teaches the person to uh, not to get fat, not to um, become impure or, you know, sexual passions that uh, it, it keeps them, it keeps society in a very calm and very, um, uh, uh, the temperate way, so that is the, the the family is a very important part of that, and the and the and property. A lot of people are very surprised by property because they think of it only in economic terms. But right, uh, you you need the stability of property for it for families and traditions to take place. If you don't have that stability, uh, you're not able to to uh, to do to do either. Uh, property is that locus. It's the place where everything takes all the uh, um, it's the, that the the stability that gives society the ability to, uh, to, to again to progress and to prosper and to go ahead so three basic values no I love the idea of, of property though too because I mean, if you think about it, we're all such creatures of habit 
you know, I mean, we yeah. go to the same pair, we go to a parish, right. But we usually sit in the same pew, right. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, when you go and sit down in your living room, you usually have your spot on the couch. So if you think yeah. about it, like property, when, when you actually dive deep into it, you're absolutely right. It provides that stability that we are craving, especially now in society. Mm-hmm. And you, you talked about family, obviously, and just the breakdown of the nuclear family. And then it, it just leads to to chaos. I mean, especially for, for children, especially growing up without fathers who, I mean, we talk about fathers and how they're, yeah. they're the, the, the cornerstone of the family, but I mean, it, it's really, and, and the Catholic family usually considered not only it's just the present nuclear family, but also the past and the future. So you, you inserted yourself into that process. And so you had an obligation to the past and to honor the past and to, you know, you had an obligation to help provide for the future. So, you know, it wasn't this selfish thing of, well, I just, I have a one family for a generation and that's it. We, you know, we don't think in terms of past or, or future. Yeah. And th- this just came to mind too. I'm doing the, uh, the Bible New Year podcast with Father Mike Schmitz. And I think we're mm-hmm. going through First Kings and Chronicles right now. And he actually talked about today how property uh, in the time of, you know, when first Kings was written was more than just a piece of land. Mm -hmm. And this was the promised land that God had provided for them and not for them, but for their families and for the generations and things like Mm -hmm. that. And, and how nowadays it's, it's not thought about that way. Like, Oh, you just buy and sell a house or things like that, but it's a commodity. Exactly. But back then that meant something. And exactly what you touched on, John, is this, that, it's that stability is that, that locus, that, that focus of our society where it's like, okay, this, this is where I can come home. This is my, my place to reset and recharge. And yeah, this it's, is what's it's right also a, a locus of culture too, because culture yeah. develops inside that, that place and localism and the idea of a local culture and how all the interactions that take place inside those, uh, th- those relationships that are there that take place in, on property, on property right. is it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so you, you, I, I know you're the patron saint of honor. So you, the TFP hosts chivalry camps. I was reading yeah. about on your website. Do you mind touching, tell me, uh, telling our audience about that a little bit? Yeah, they're called the uh, call to chivalry camps. We I'll just had one camps. last okay. week and uh, it's a unique opportunity for young boys. Um, let's say um, 12 to 12 to 18. And um, it's a ten. It's usually a week to ten day program, in which you we we get together these young men from all over the country, and actually we have no problem filling the slots. Uh, everybody's looking for this kind of thing, so it's really really a great uh, opportunity for them. And uh, we also uh, sometimes it would, if fathers want to come along, they can. So mm, you know, we'll okay. have maybe you know, eight or 10 fathers uh, uh, also there to help out and to do a lot of things. It's a combination of uh, games, very physical, um, rough and tumble, rough and tumble. Uh, you also have, you know, uh, very uh, uh, sword fighting, you know, to, uh, with, with foam swords. Uh, not oh, sure, anything, sure. You know. <laughs> but we, would, do they, we do teach fencing sometimes uh, to them, yeah. um, not at the camps, but other places in our school, let's for example. But then, uh, so they will have a very intense um, physical activities, uh, but then we'll also have, um, we generally have a theme, uh, a historic theme for the camp. So it will be Spain, for example, and we'll talk about the reconquest and all the things that took place in Spain, the Catholic virtues in Spain. It'll be France. This year was actually Austria, so that's why uh, Andreas Hoffer came to mind. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's it was uh you know each each year is a theme that um uh we can take examples and present them to the young you know the the young men and uh saying well this is what you have to do you have to you have to engage the culture with this same spirit and then there is the, the also the uh spiritual aspect you'll have we'll have mass there not every day because some, usually these camps are pretty far out there um uh, but we will have conf- opportunity for confession, daily rosary uh, in common, uh, even a ro- rosary processions, um, mm-hmm. you know, get them very, uh, allow them to 
manifest their faith together with other young men, which is a great opportunity because they're, they're not there in that particular atmosphere. They're not embarrassed to show their faith with other young boys. And, and it is, um, it is uh, cell phone free and video game free. So none of that is on the audience. Praise, praise God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, you learn, you learn, you just, it's, there's any inc incompatibility. You can't, you know, they, they have to put away their cell phones and everything. So they can't have that on there. And so it's, it's a very robust program. It's very, uh, and they enjoy it very much. Um, we have a, the, the, the boys, uh, I, I, you know, I'm just shocked sometimes to see them because they'll, they'll ask a lot of questions. They are really, they can, they can, you can get them. They, when you expose young men to the, to, to beauty, the good, the true, the beautiful and the faith, um, they react very well because you're not asking them to do something that's against their nature. It's something in accordance with the nature, our nature naturally tends toward these things. And so it's, you're not forcing them to do anything. You know, you are, mm -hmm. you are uh, helping them along and they are, and, and they react well, especially at that age. And they, they just love it. You know, it's a very good opportunity to, to teach them these values. Now, what, what a powerful statement though, is uh, boys crave that, they you do. know, yeah. and that, that yeah. brotherhood and, brotherhood. Uh, I, I, Father uh, Dom and me did um, a few episodes on rite of passages for young boys. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about how around age 12, 13 is when boys generally start to look more towards uh, a male role models in their mm -hmm. life for, okay, how do I become a man now? Mm -hmm. And so that, that camp that you mentioned, the, the call, call to chivalry, you yes. said, correct? Call to chivalry is so powerful because as they start to transition to, okay, I'm looking more towards a fatherly figure now. Mm -hmm. And now I have these fellow brothers who are going through these same experiences that I am. And not only that, but then they have people maybe are 16, 17, 18, that are a few grades mm -hmm. above them. It's like, oh, okay. Like they're doing this too. Like, this is cool. Like I can do this as well. So that, and that's great. I love too, that. Also and the dad's there too. Also the Yeah. Yes. The older older men and in fact i think the dads sometimes enjoy it more than their sons because <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking today so well maybe we should have a camp for men, for our dads you know? yes <laughs> they, would, they would love it you know i i would love to do well i'm gonna have to uh to look for these call to show i have two young boys john i okay. have a, a three and a half and a one-year-old so they're a okay. few years oh. out but uh, <laughs> i'll have to start planting the seed okay <laughs> that. that's good. um so uh, kind of going back to something I saw on YouTube. Um, so one of the more recent wins that we saw, Ryan and I, was the opposition to an after-school Satanist club. Mm -hmm. um, so you can you tell us a little bit more about what you are seeing, maybe yourself or through your experiences at talking to other men, as far as movements of the devil in our society? Um, so kind of what are some action items for people to consider in opposing some of these movements of the devil, because I mean, clearly the rise of Satanism is very real in our society. It's not a myth anymore. Yeah, definitely. I think we're seeing the mainstreaming of Satanism, and, and that is the that is the intention of people like the Satanic Temple and other Satanic groups. Is they they present themselves as saying, "Well, we're just like anyone else. We're just you know, we just worship a different god." We no, we don't even worship a god. They were they don't, they don't even like to say they worship Satan, but in in any case. They are introducing these things to young people, you know, after say after school Satan clubs, and uh, we have we it's it's sort of it's the cutting edge of the cultural revolution, and so it's always good to confront the cutting edge, and so one of the, that's what we have been doing. Whenever we see these things happen, we will organize protests, and we have a we have a network of of activists across the country where we can you know call upon them and say, well, can you protest this, and. Uh, you know, I think it's a, it is a, it, it, it's very interesting. We had this, the, what the, probably the video you saw was right near where we live. And we were surprised by, because something like 200 or 300 people were at the, at the hearing. I mean, it really got people upset. And the, the, the school board uh, vetoed the Satanic Club uh, seven to one. So it was mm. a, it was a overwhelming victory. And so, you know, we, if, if you get enough people, you know, that people involved and engaged, it, we, you can defeat it. 
and we defeated one in Indiana, another one somewhere else. You know, you just have to be, you have to be out there. And uh, so we're, we, we try to get people out there, especially on these very um, cutting edge issues like, like Satanism. Yeah, I, I think too, let me change the view here real quick, sorry. There we go. There's so many people, I think, too, John, maybe you can speak to this as well, where they want to speak up, but they don't, either they're fearful or like, mm -hmm. I don't want to lose my job or I have a family, so I don't want to, you know, step on toes. Mm -hmm. But when they see organizations like TFP, it, it can serve as a, almost a call to action or a, 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 a battle cry, if you will, say, mm -hmm. oh, like, here's these fellow Catholics who are standing up for things that I believe in. And, and we always talk about strength in numbers, right? If you see yes. 30, especially young men, like TFP mm -hmm. always does that on campuses. I mean, that can't help but inspire you, especially if you're like, hey, I'm Catholic and th they are fighting for what I believe in. So maybe I can join them and help them out as well. Yeah, definitely. And with our, our, our activist network is one of the things we do is make it easy for people to protest. So if we have a, pro, uh, a campaign that we're doing or protesting, um, we will make them a banner. We have a, this, this huge banner machine that makes these 10 foot banners. And we just do miles and miles of these banners. You know, just, oh, and we send them out. <laughs> Say we have a banner, you have a manual that tells you the step-by-step -step how to do it, you know, how to, what, to, what to say, uh, how to advertise. You know, it's, we try to make it as easy po as possible to do these kind of things. So one thing that we did this month in June was to, uh, we sent out, I th I'm tempted to say 500 or 600 banners against pride masses. Wow. And, and uh, amazing. So in front of these masses, uh, unfortunately we have to, you know, we we're doing it. We have to do this and we don't, right. you know, we don't like to do it because it's, it is the church and we, you know, we, but we are protesting to say, well, this should not be happening in the Catholic church. And so, yeah. You know, and it definitely gets their attention. We're all, and one of the things that we find is a lot of these things are, they try to, to get in hidden, you know, they, they hide it. And so if you bring it out, they're very careful afterwards. That, that mm. Yeah. When you, when you shine light in the darkness, all the, all the critters run away, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that. exactly. We've done a lot of also a drag queen story hour protests oh. as well. Yeah, they're all over the place, but uh, we've stopped a lot of them. We've stopped a lot of them. Thank God. Yeah, that is, gosh, that is so sad that, it, I, I mean, you think about, it used to be kind of on the outskirts and like, okay, that's oh, yeah. weird and frowned upon, but now they're just, they're just out in the open and they're just targeting children, especially when they go after children. Yes. Yeah. It's just, it's just pure diabolical and evil. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, that's pure satanic and to go yes, after right. innocence, to go after innocence yes. like that. I mean, Satan hates innocence, right? Right. Yeah, so. exactly. And they are grooming. I mean, that is yeah. they use the word and, and they have even have used that word. So, I mean, it's not as if we're saying it, but they, they definitely don't like to, for people to say that now. I mean, it's, it, it is, but it does reveal their intention. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great that we have organizations like TFP that is exposing them like that as yeah. well. So, so you mentioned uh, you help people who want to organize a protest and things like that. So how would they go about that process uh, going on the website or contacting certain individuals? How would someone want to do that? I wish I had the actual uh, email address. So do you have uh, show notes? I do. Yeah. Let me, uh, uh, let I me could write it down here. Yeah. I, I don't have it with me now, but I can okay. ask and I could give, put it in the show notes. Yeah, so absolutely. Could, you know, uh, the minute you see something like that, you can um, you can email um, the person. Um, I know the email. I, I I don't know if I can get on the my email account at this point. I can That's probably okay. find it, but well, I'll send it to you right afterwards. I'll send it to yeah. you right afterwards. Perfect. And then if you send it to that this that email address, uh, we will get in touch with you, and you can actually. Uh, do a protest or, you know, if there's somebody in the area that is actually doing the protest uh, to, about the event that you're upset with, uh, they'll get in contact and you can, you can come together. Wonderful. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then the, the call to chivalry camps, I wanted to, I forgot to ask you as well. Is that, is there uh, contact 
our uh, link on the on the website. Yeah, I can give you that website. link as well. John Ritchie, who is the head of TP Student Action, okay. uh, he has a um, um, he has a whole whole team there that will get in touch with people. Excellent. And, uh, this year is closed. I mean, we're we're just uh, we're just we did one in Pennsylvania. We're doing one in Louisiana next week, and one in Florida in about five or six days. So and that's Wonderful. it. The seasons, but we we will okay. have, we're definitely there. They're there, and sometimes we'll have um, college every weekends at places. So is if your name's on the list, you you may get a call. It's it's pretty perfect. Easy. Work that out. Good to know. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to uh, put in a word for maybe 10 years down the road. John, you can put in a word for uh, one in Michigan for my yeah, boys. <laughs> I'll definitely, I'll, yeah, I can put my, my good, my two cents in saying, look, this, there you one, go. this one coming down, we'll, we'll work it out. And you'll get a special, uh, special notice. And, I'll, All right. I'll, and you'll, you'll, you can also be invited to come as well. I'll be, I'll be one of the dads. It's like, why is that dad having so much fun? He's, he's having more fun than the kids. Like, yep, that's me. <laughs> Uh, well, it well, definitely John, helps. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you see enthusiastic, like I said, people that are above you in age, it only helps but trickle down to the to the younger ones as well. So, yeah, yeah. so John, I do want to transition a little bit. Um, so I know you wrote a book, Return to Order. Mm -hmm. Do you, Do you mind telling our audience a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, it's a uh, it's a book that actually began uh, in 1986, um, <laughs> a long time ago. And it was uh, the founder of the Brazilian TFP, Professor Plinio Pereira Rivera. Um, he, uh, he was a very astute observer of political and, and, uh, political and economic and, and cultural events. And he got together a group of Americans way back then, then and said, you, you all need to study um, medieval economy, what the church teaches about economy and, and its relationships to the culture. And, and so uh, we started a research committee commission and um, started looking into these these affairs. And uh, uh, we, we would, uh, the, some of the Americans who were actually lived down there would have regular meetings. And those who went down there on occasion, like myself, I uh, would attend those meetings. And so there were probably about, uh, probably 80 of those meetings where we discussed those particular things. And so uh, as a result of those meetings, um, we were working on a, a book of some sort. And but it, uh, with the death of Professor Plinio, uh, we we didn't uh, we didn't carry it forward. And so um, later on, uh, I got together with another commission and of Americans here in the United States in Pennsylvania, and we started working and hammering out uh, this book uh, around from 2008 to 2012. It took four years. And it's a book that uh, helps people understand better where we went wrong in our economy and in our culture and where we need to go from a Catholic perspective. It is, discusses all the really, you know, the hot button, button issues of economy. You know, when is it too big? When is it too small? What's the uh, re relationship between family, community, faith, and, and, and economy? What's the role of money? How does money work? Um, and uh, a lot of very uh, organic, organic Christian society, how an organic society um, develops. Uh, that is um, where uh, an organic society is where all those natural relationships and leaderships work in conjunction for the common good and, and, and uh, allow society to, to advance like it did in Christendom. So those are the issues, a lot of the issues that are discussed in the book, Return to Order. Um, just um, a lot of things that the, a lot of the treasures the church has that uh, are hidden and have been forgotten. And I was, I was actually very surprised to see a lot of these things, you know, that came up in the, in the, in the course of research of, um, you know, what a real economy is and how, how it should be developed. Yeah. Like I said, I've only read the intro so far, but I love the analogy of the ship, cruise the cruise ship, ship that yeah. you talk about. And it's kind of ironic to talk about as, as the church is, is, is looked to as, you know, the, the ark, the ship as well. But yes. in the case of the church, so in the cruise ship, it's just, you have all these levels and it's like a big party, yes. but eventually 
you get tired of it. It's like, yeah. is there, is there more to this? Is there yeah. something more to this? And that's, I, I just thought it's kind of the great irony, but because the church is compared, compared to a boat or a ship, mm -hmm. but that is the, it, it's moving towards a destination. It's moving towards a goal versus right. that cruise ship. I, the way I was envisioned as I was reading it, it's like, it's just going in a big circle. Yeah. Like we have no, we have no destination. We don't know what we're doing. And that's never where ending cruise. Yeah. it's a never ending cruise. And those are, those are boring. Right. But yes. you just look at our society. Yes. There's no rudder. It's just, what right. is our society? What is our society's ultimate goal? Right. And I don't think, you know, whoever is can answer that question. I don't know if they actually have a destination. Right. And it, that is pretty much our postmodern society. It's, it's yeah. it, postmodernity. Uh, takes uh, takes away the narratives in society so that you don't have beginnings and ends. It's all experience now, you know, present experience. And so it's whatever pleases you at the moment and uh, not thinking of the responsibilities and duties and the things that are part of, uh, that have been part of our civilization. They hate civilization. So uh, yeah, that's where we're at. And, and this cruise ship is a very, is what's what we're seeing, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so John, I want to finish up with my last question. Mm -hmm. And in your view, what does it mean to be a manly Catholic? Oh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that was a good question. I, I agree. Um, well, I mean, I think a, a manly Catholic does not, it's, first of all, it's not the macho, it's not the, the muscles that make the difference. Um, a manly Catholic, I, I would say a manly uh, man, uh, Catholic man would be, um, I think he has to be very rational, and very systematic and dealing with things, uh, takes, takes things, their, their final consequences, their final, you know, to take things to the end. Uh, that's a very important part of being a man, that uh, men are analytical, they, they tend to look toward the, to, to the long term. And uh, today's uh, young men usually don't, they they don't like to think in the terms of the future. It's it's uh, it's 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 really a shame. Um, I don't. I would also say a, a man like Catholic man is not emotional. He has emotions, but he's not emotional. He doesn't allow the emotions to overcome. Um, it's good to have emotions. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not. That's not our role. Our role is to to uh, display strength, display a decision. It's a very. Uh, it is a leadership role, especially in a family. So I would say that would definitely be another. And I would say uh, another, another characteristic would be uh, a man is pious, piety that is very important. And uh, that is something that I think is, needs to really be defined and developed because um, a lot of piety is displayed very, in a very feminine way or in a very weak way. And that's not what it means to be a pious in the Catholic sense. You know, a lot of saint, uh, most of the Catholic men, Catholic men saints are, were very, very strong men. They have very decided, and you get some of these statues and pictures, they look very uh, just wimpy. And, you know, I think we need to instill in ourselves the idea uh, you could be pious and manly and strong and decided and, uh, you know, all at the same time. In fact, that's what it really means, means to do it. So that when we pray the rosary with the young with the young men, we we pray in a loud voice, not in a in just a, a very a soft voice. We uh, we encourage them to be manly and to be decisive. So yes, um, piety is a very important part of being a man. Um, a man is also uh, protective and and protects and and uh, you know is it goes against injustice. Uh, I wish I had it here. I don't. Um, in fact, some of the boys were at, uh, were asked to memorize the Ten Commandments of Chivalry. Uh, that oh. are, uh, were, are there are there are several versions of them, but there is a standard version of the Ten Commandments of Chivalry, which uh, um, outlined exactly what it is to be a pious man. Uh, mm. But a lot of them are uh, love thy country, uh, defend the t defend the weak, defend the church. Uh, um, uh, I there. We could probably put that in the show notes as well. Absolutely. Like, I'd love that. that. That defines a Catholic man. And we have competitions during the camp where we ask them to, you know, who whoever can, uh, who can present the Ten Commandments by memory the best, they get a prize. So they get a, they get a prize. So that it is, is one of the competitions. So 
I heard it at the last time, I, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't, I haven't memorized it, but <laughs> some of the boys have. <laughs> No prize for you, John. Sorry. No prize. Yeah. <laughs> but it was uh, we can we can we can erase that. Uh, all right. Well, John, before we wrap up, just if you don't mind sharing with our viewers, you know where to learn more about you, where to get your book, where to learn more about TFP. Okay. There. Yeah. There are two websites. Uh, one of them is www.tfp.org. That's the one of the American Society for the Defense of Traditional Family Property. Uh, there you have all sorts of articles. Um, uh, we have a lot of petitions. If you want, if you are act, uh, if you are an activist, you can always. There's always a petition on the front page where you can protest against a lot of these horrible things that are happening. There is a bookstore with a lot of our books. Uh, there are um, just uh, there are a lot of resources on there. The second website is www.returntoorder.org, which is the the um, uh, website dedicated to the book Return to Order. It's more focused on the issues that are mentioned in the book and um, commentaries trying to apply the book to our present situation. So there you'll also find the same, uh, the same thing, these articles and um, resources. Also protests, we do protests with this as well. So you can sign up or subscribe to either one of those websites and you'll be able to, um, to find out more about us. We also have a website called American East Fatima, which is um, a more devotional website, but it has a lot to do with um, uh, the fat of a devotion and and, uh, and uh, rosary and all the things that are associated with the fat of a devotion. So those are three websites. I think they'll give you some idea of who we are and what we're doing. Perfect. And then for all of you listening out there, I'll put a link in the show notes to all those as well. So people can just click on it and go right to the websites that John mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for the work that you do with TFP. It sounds like it, it is an amazing organization from what I've I delved into myself online and then just hearing you talk about it. Definitely need more, more people a part of the, of TFP and, and standing up for, for truth and for what the church teaches. So thank you for the work that you do. No, it's a pleasure. And anytime just, yeah. And uh, we, we all need to work together. We all need to fight together. It's uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's what we're called to do at this point. So let's Absolutely. keep going. Press the attack. Amen. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of The Manly Catholic. So go out there and be a saint.